One day when I was in fourth grade, the buzz in every classroom was that some big movie director named Woody Allen was at our school looking to cast kids for his new film, Annie Hall. They would be used in a flashback scene at the opening of the film where Woody Allen's character wonders what became of his classmates at his Brooklyn Elementary School. Woody came and went, but I never got the tap on the shoulder. Worst of all, I was invited to the New York premiere with some of my schoolmates who had made the cut. <laughs> my heart plummeted as I watched Susie Mellinger in her thick black glasses deliver the line, I'm into leather. <laughs> 20 years later, I had moved to San Diego and was living in a cozy honeymoon cottage with my new husband. My photo ran in the local paper for some feminist rebel rousing I was involved with, and by some stroke of good fortune, a film director was in town and saw the article. The newspaper reporter called me to ask if it would be okay to share my phone number with the director so his people could call me for a movie audition. Yeah, it would be okay, in the same way it would be just fine to discover that the bank had made an error in my favor of like a million dollars. The payoff I sought, though, <laughs> wasn't money. My form of currency was outside validation. I have a pitiful and bottomless need for external approval, a deep craving to be told by others, you're worthy, you're special, you're loved. This goes beyond the normal wanting people to like me. I found myself in places that I didn't want to be, volunteering for jobs that I had absolutely no interest in, and saying I agreed with things that I really didn't, all to impress people I didn't even like. The director who called for my contact info was Cameron Crowe, and his upcoming movie was called Jerry Maguire. I would have been happy playing a dead body in a horror movie. But he had just cast, cast Tom Cruise in the title role, so this was going to be a big deal, a real Hollywood blockbuster. Soon, I was on the phone with a young woman at a casting agency who sounded like she was bored with our conversation before it even began. <laughs> she was no doubt in her early 20s and a size negative two, because I could tell this because of the world-weary vocal fry that only the young and starving can affect. <laughs> Yeah, C Cameron wants to see you Tuesday, she said. <laughs> Cameron Crowe, the guy who wrote Fast Times at Ridgemont High, the one who penned Say Anything and invented holding a boombox over your head and standing outside of a girl's window, wanted to see me. I had been discovered. Someone from the magical world of Hollywood had seen something special in me. This was a fairy tale wrapped in a Hollywood story, and I was the super special twinkling star of it. <laughs> the assistant quickly brought me back down to earth by informing me, yeah, there's going to be a divorced women's group, and Cameron wants women who look bitter. You'd be like a bitter divorced woman number three. <laughs> okay, so in this fairy tale, I would be cast as the ugly stepsister, but I was still in the fairy tale, so that's fine, whatever. I drove up to Hollywood, I drove up to Culver City, and the assistant at the casting office was just as I had imagined her. Short black bangs and a body so empty, it looked like she was going to collapse, like one of those oddly mesmerizing windsock dolls in, in front of wireless phone stores and auto dealerships. She was perfect. Suddenly, I heard a woman's voice. She was having a phone conversation in an office out of sight. Oh, that's fucking bullshit! The voice barked. She knows the business. She fucks up an audition and that's it. 
No, there are no such second fucking chances, and I can't even fucking believe you'd call and ask. She slammed down the phone. Note to self. Do not blow this audition. The woman lumbered out of her office, huffing before noticing me sitting in her lobby chair, trying desperately not to pee my pants from fear. (laughs) Oh, hey, sorry you had to hear that, she said. Her name was Gail, and she was the head of casting for the movie. She was heavy and wore a large poncho muumuu thing and a wide cloth band around her frizzy blonde hair. You know how it is, though. People calling and asking for second chances for auditions they fucked up. (laughs) I nodded sympathetically and quietly wondered if it was my sweat that smelled like urine or, or if I had actually peed in the chair. Shockingly, the audition with Gail and Cameron went really well. We chatted for about an hour, and then they handed me a script from which I was to read my bitter divorced lines. Cameron, we were on a first name basis now, told me that the divorced women's group scenes would be mostly improvised, and he instructed me to just riff on the lines. Just be hilarious. Wait, um, hilarious or bitter? Mercifully, my fear and confusion amused them. Perfect, Cameron said, nodding enthusiastically. This is going to work great. I was in. (laughs) Cameron said I just needed to come back in a few weeks and meet some of the other women they were considering for the divorced women's group. The wannabes, I thought smugly, wondering if it would be too soon to ask for a bigger part. Not like the star or anything, just a little something to earn my Oscar as the best new discovery plucked from obscurity. The Friday before my callback, that's what we showbiz people call a second audition, I came down with a hacking cough. But I knew Gail's rule. No second chances. The audition was with a group anyway, so there was no way to reschedule. My choices were show up and try my best, or cancel and forfeit the biggest break of my life. Being divorced woman number three was more than about having a walk-on role in a movie. It was like being told that I was special and lucky and chosen. I desperately longed to hear this because in the quiet moments when I was alone with my thoughts, I often felt quite the opposite. Partly because of this, I decided that I needed to take off five pounds in a hurry. So I went on a weekend diet of lemon juice and air, and I bought a top-of-the-line girdle, two sizes too small for me. Once I squeezed into this contraption, no small feat, I could feel my internal organs crowding together like people in a packed elevator. (laughs) I couldn't breathe, but it was totally worth it. But then, as I was driving to Los Angeles, the loss of circulation made my legs start to go numb. When I arrived at the casting office, Skeletor at the front desk told me I was ridiculously early and that Cameron was still in with the first group of bitter women. First group? There was another group? Yeah. There are like three groups we're seeing today. I fell into my seat, suddenly feeling a lot less special and chosen. I started coughing, sounding like someone crumpling gift wrapping paper. Then I went to the bathroom and noticed that, thanks to the girdle, the bottom half of my legs were starting to turn the pale blue of the recently dead. (laughs) I heard Cameron and Gail's voices (laughs) coming from down the hall where they had just finished the audition with the first group of bitter divorced women. The casting director sighed a laugh as though she was recalling something wonderful. 
They were fucking terrific. Completely fucking nailed it. 20 minutes later, I was led into a room with half a dozen other women. Cameron told us to just improvise and be hilarious about what it felt like to be divorced during the holidays. <laughs> One woman started with the killer fresh line, it is so hard to be single during the holidays. Then another woman chimed in that she often felt suicidal this time of year. In other words, comedy gold. I was no better. I opened my mouth to add something, but all that came out was a cough. A frighteningly tubercular cough. <laughs> the audition went even further downhill with one dark, depressing line after the other. Finally, Cameron thanked us for coming in and told the lot of us that they'd be in touch. I knew it was over. I wish I could say I shrugged and let it go. I wish I was one of those people who could turn disappointment into happy messages from the universe. But the rejection, it was physically painful. People asked why I couldn't just focus on what a great experience it was to meet a famous director. But the truth was that this denial of approval confirmed what I already knew at a core cellular level. I was not special. I wasn't lucky. I wasn't even good enough to play a bitter woman without a name. I needed to change this. So I picked up the phone and I did the unthinkable. I called Gail and I asked for another chance to be in the movie. <laughs> she sighed before unleashing what I was sure would be a profanity-laden tirade, but it was so much worse. She was pityingly kind. She told me it was a tough decision and that they really, truly fucking loved me. I asked, correction, I, I begged for another part. The taxi driver, the receptionist at the sports agency, anything. Gail told me I was adorable, which was just another way of saying goodbye. Listen, I do a lot of casting. This is not going to be the last you hear of us. She told me that Cameron had another project he was working on, and this one he would be filming in San Diego. That movie would be called Almost Famous, Cameron Crowe's semi-autobiographical account of his youth as a reporter for Rolling Stone magazine. I went back to my life working at an office and volunteering for good causes, but I regularly checked the trade, movie trade pu publications to see when they were casting Almost Famous, and I waited for my call. I waited for weeks and then months until I finally came to the realization that I was never going to hear from Cameron or Gail again. Like Annie Hall, I saw Almost Famous and Jerry Maguire in the movie theater, and just like, just like everybody else. And like when I was nine years old, I plastered a smile on my face at all the best lines and silently grumbled, it should have been me.